All right, so I already set up this animation. Uh, it's something I was working on earlier today, but I just made some changes to it. Watch the head. Let me zoom in. So whenever you need to swap out artwork, it could be um, logos or uh, other art files in your animations. Here's a fast little trick. Uh, good evening, Stephanie. I'm just going over a little tip to fill the time. I taught this very early in the semester, but you know it's good to get back to it. If you've got something selected in your timeline and selected in your project panel. If you hold down the Alt or Option key while you drag it over onto the new one, it'll replace what's inside everything in that layer, like the keyframes, the effects. And so there's a fast way of swapping out artwork on the fly if you need to. Uh, it's also good for doing templatable design. It also, as you saw, it kept all the alpha mat settings for the textures as well. So if you're working with people who don't know uh, that much for the advanced stuff, like, you know, like I said, like how to set up alpha mats and all that, you can do this template and just remind them, say, hey, make sure it's selecting the timeline and the project panel. And then you hold down alter option and it'll replace what's in there. You just set up however you like. And like I said, it keeps all the keyframes, the effects, as well as any matting details. And we'll be tackling Adobe Premiere tonight. We'll be finishing up video editing. All right, so the quick recap, you know, I just hit the project. I'll call this that. So that's where you name it. And you click there to save it where you want to, then hit OK. Just like in Adobe After Effects, in Adobe Premiere, you can double click in your project panel to import your files, or you can go File, Import File, as we covered before. And should be all of these, good. And there we go. But just a reminder, you double click on the video clip, and that'll bring it into the source monitor. And you could scrub with your playhead, choose your in and out points, where it's going to start and where it's going to end. So I'll just pick like right here. You could also hit the I and the O keys on your keyboard. Like that. And like I said, if you drag from here, it will take the audio and the video. You could take just the video dragging from here and just the audio dragging from there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this to the page icon just to get my sequence set up in the timeline. And there is the shot. And just a reminder, it's non-destructive. See? What I trimmed off is still there. There's just a way of keeping a nice clean timeline. Let's pretend you've got a long clip and you want to take out several parts. And don't forget, you can zoom in and out of your timeline right down here. So you want to trim up the clip because there's only parts of it you want and parts of it you don't. There's two ways of doing that. It's a very common editing workflow. Move the playhead to where you want and then grab the razor tool over here on the side. Let me zoom in. So you move your playhead to where you want, grab your razor tool and click where the playhead's at and that will split the clip. So that splits the clip. Then you scrub to the next part you want your cut and you trim there. So you could say, I want this part. I don't want that part. So you could cut that part out. And remember if you right click in a gap in the timeline, you get ripple delete and that'll slide everything together so it snaps shut and i'm going to show you one more way of splitting up a clip into multiple clips and this is the fast way this is the way i work move the playhead to where you want have the clip or clips selected multiple ones remember you can stack them in layers and that's good for superimposing putting text over special effects stuff like that so with as many clips as you want selected Hold down Command or Control and hit the K key, and that will cut all those clips at the timeline. And you can scrub to where you want your next cut, do the same thing, hold down Control or Command and hit K, and you get a split. So I could say, well, I'm going to delete this part, and then close up the gap by right-clicking and choosing Ripple Delete. And that's two ways you can get multiple, cup, multiple cuts from the same clip. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Like I said, video editing is very easy to learn. It's just, it takes time and practice to get good with your rhythm and your pacing. Watch what happens uh, right here. I'm just going to click and drag. And what had happened was 
This is the video track, and this track is for the audio. They moved together because they're linked. Now, if I want this video and audio track to start separately, like say there's someone coughing or something like that, and I don't want that at the beginning of this clip, there's two things you can do. The non-destructive way of editing it is to hold down the Alt or Option key. And you see, now I have a red arrow at just the audio track. And I trimmed only the beginning of the audio while the video stays where it is. And just a reminder, audio and video, when they're together like this, this is called synchronous media, meaning they're synced up. So you got to watch that your audio track doesn't separate from the video track or else then you'll get into some trouble because that's when you've seen movies where people's mouths don't match the speech. That's how that happens. And I'm going to show you how to unlink them because sometimes you need to. You just select your clip, you right click and choose unlink. And now I can just delete that whole section of audio. When you do that, let's try that one more time. I'm going to hit unlink. So now they're no longer synced up. I'm going to move this and I'll move my clips around. I'm just making a couple quick changes. Now let's see what happens if I select them again, if I can relink them. Hmm. Okay. So I was able to relink them, but just watch because if I moved this audio from side to side, I only trimmed it, but if I move it as well as trim it, then it will not sync up with the video because I would have slid where it was. I'll show you what that looks like. I'm going to right click, choose on link. Okay. As you can see, even though I trimmed the beginning, the end of the audio lines up with the end of the video. These are unlinked. See, I'm moving it around. Now let's say right here, the bird calls. Well, that call will be over here now. So you got to watch that your audio and your video stay lined up to make sure. Let me relink these to make sure your clips stay together and whatnot. I'm going to move these a little bit right here is the magnetic snap on and off. If you need to do something precise, turn it off, move your playhead, and then you can have it snap that way to where the playhead is, but I normally keep it on when I'm editing for uh, large details like that. And again, I'm just holding down right click and then choosing ripple delete. Uh, but that's how you turn off and on the snapping. If you need to slide things around and you want more finesse, like the snap might set it to a frame that you don't want. So that's where you turn it off and on. Okie doke. So I'm going to clean up my timeline. And I'm going to drag this up a little bit like such Hit save. I showed you the basics in like five, 10 minutes, but now I'm showing you a more professional workflow, a more intermediate knowledge of it. That's a sequence. These are the video clips and I'll even bring in some audio one second. And again, if you're working with audio, um, when you know something is royalty free music, like I showed you where to download from YouTube, make a folder and keep all that in there just so you know what is royalty free and it's just much less of a hassle because when you do hundreds of videos a year like I do, you need this quick workflow. This is the icon for a sequence. This is the icon for a video clip because there's the little thumbnail of the film strip and the sound file over top of it, video and audio together. And this is what the icon for just an audio track looks like, like the music. So I'm going to just drag this whole clip in here. Right click, snap it to the beginning because remember your clips will go wherever the playhead is. Uh, I'm going to put this right here and I'm going to put this right over here and you can go right there. Sure. Now, if you need to add more tracks, you just right here in the gray part, right click and choose add track or add tracks if you need to add more than one. And from there, you can choose, let's say, two more video and two more audio. You can even say where they start. If you want them in between, you could do that. So like, oh, I want this to start after video two. And I want this one to start after audio two. Like that, see, now I've got a split. And I can now put this right there. 
and I could throw this audio, since it's audio only, right there. And if you need to delete a track, like I've got a gap here, because I counted wrong, I just right click and choose delete track, and now that gap is gone, and I've got less tracks to have to manage. Remember, if you need to increase these blue boxes, that's what you can select for that layer to put things in and out of. And it also helps with snapping the playhead. Like, uh, remember, right and left will go one frame, up and down will go between cuts. But you see, that's not working right now because I don't have this layer selected. It's skipping right over it. If I select that layer and I hit the down key, now it's going to snap to it. So to turn off and on snapping with the up and down keys, make sure those layers are selected. And now it's going from cut to cut. We've only used the arrow tool. And then I showed you how to use the razor tool, which you could also, like I said, just move your playhead, select the clip or clips and hit control K or command K. And that'll, that'll cut them right where the playhead is. It'll split that clip. And these up and down, that's, you know, helps you slide around your timeline. And you could also go like that to, because remember this is the audio and that's the video. So there's lots of ways of working in your timeline. Uh, one more thing I'm going to show you real fast. Say this audio, I want to sync things up, but I, I need to see a little bit better. If I hover over that clip, I mean that track right there, and I hold down Alt and I scrub with my mouse wheel, I can magnify that audio track. And that'll help me see that WAV file a little bit better to know where I want to sync things up to, like with beats or sound effects. So that's what happens if you're over the track right here and you hold down Alt and scrub. Same thing will happen with the clip in the playhead, the video. Now I'm seeing a thumbnail of what that video clip is. Now, the reason I spread all these out like this, and don't forget, you can zoom in and out of your timeline with this right here. And I'm going to move this up a little bit just so we can see all our clips. This is the track forward and backward tool. It's right below the select tool, and this differs. If I use my select tool, it'll select one clip. If I click and drag, it'll select whatever I clicked and dragged. But watch how powerful the track forward and backward is. It moves every clip to the point of where it's at. So if I just want to move from here on down, it'll get everything in that timeline after it. So if I'm right here, it's just going to grab those two clips. If I do it from here, it'll grab three clips. Okay. That is the power of the track forward and track backward tool. Obviously forward is going this way, backward is going that way. I'm going to show you a practical solution. You saw everything moved. Let's pretend this music has to stay here. Well then I simply lock the track, hitting the lock key over there. And then I click my track forward and I can move these clips around and you see the music doesn't move because I locked it. So that's one way where you can keep your video and audio tracks synced up and move them around multiple ways and choose which layers you want to be locked so they don't move with the track forward and backward. I've got some audio here. I unlocked it. Say I want to fade in the music. Well, to keyframe, to keyframe in Premiere, it's a bit of a nightmare. It is nowhere near as easy to work in as After Effects. What you do is you select the layer and then remember anything with the uh, stopwatch, you can keyframe animate. So I want to fix the volume. That is the level. And it's already set with the stopwatch on. So I could just click the empty diamond or I could turn that off if I want. So I'm just going to turn it back on and there is keyframe right there. So I'm going to go forward a little bit and click the empty diamond right here to add a keyframe. And you can zoom in and out, moving this slider. So I wanna go and fade this in. So I'm gonna go like minus 20, up to there, and the audio will fade in. And that is an example of keyframing in Adobe Premiere. You just go to your effect control and choose what you want. So if I wanted this to zoom in, I would go to motion, scale, move the playhead to where I want to make my change, then click the stopwatch I want to change. I'm going to scale in, 
move my playhead, then change the amount. And there you go. Just with video, be careful. You cannot scale it up that much. Okay, you can scale it down, that's fine, but it's just like a photo in Photoshop. You want to try and work at a one-to-one -one ratio when possible. I believe if you select your keyframe and right click, yeah, I can Bezier, ease in, ease out. Now remember, I want to ease out of the first frame, keyframe, and ease into the second keyframe. Some people use the expression, you ease out of your driveway and then you ease into a parking spot. That's just the way to think of it, but you're going out the first frame and into the second frame. That, you're going out the first keyframe and into the second keyframe. That's how I remember it. So we covered the select tool. You know, you just move your clips around that way. And you could also click and drag the ends to change their in and out point inside the timeline. We covered the track forward, track backward, which moves multiple tracks across multiple layers based off of where you have the arrow tool selected so you didn't get those. If I do it from here, let's go grab all of them. Great way to keep your work together and your edits unchanged. You're just changing the pacing of your work that time. So next, we're going to use the type tool. And that's right down here. And clearly, you just click in the program monitor. And let me find that text layer where to go. It's right there. So any special layers that you make in Premiere, again, you could grab the edges and click and drag and change where they start and stop. And you notice this is pink and that is letting me know this is my type layer. So I selected it up here. And to edit it, I go to my effect controls right here, twirl down the type, and this is where you can change the font, like such, and here's for the size, and you keep going, you've got other options, fills, drop shadows, say it's a little hard to read, well that's a stroke, there should be a drop shadow one, yeah, there's a shadow right there, and you can change the angle, the distance, etc. So now that you know how to add type and you know how to keyframe animate, you could fade this off and on or scale it up and down just like in After Effects. So if I want to fade this on, that would be opacity. So I just find the opacity in the motion should be right here. Yep. Click the stopwatch, move forward. Click the stopwatch, we'll change it to zero. It's going from zero to 100. And then I can just fade it off again, however I want. Click the keyframe, because remember, if I'm fading it off, I want to add a frame that's 100. So I'm going zero, 100, 100. Move my playhead, change back down to zero. And I'm going to mute that music so it doesn't drive us all crazy. And that's just some people at the zoo making some noise. And there you have it. I'm going to delete that type. And I'm going to put this here. So I'm going to explain this in a second. I'm just going to mute all these tracks. And I'm going to delete that. I'm going to show you how to add a transition in two different ways. I'm going to put this transition, well, I'm going to put this clip, but it right up with the other one. Wait a second. Well, the only way to really add a transition is you either click and drag it over the beginning of a clip, or if they're on the same layer like these, between two clips. Okay, so that's telling me that it's going to repeat some frames because I have that full clip there. So what that means is if I move it over now, I trimmed off some of that. So that means now there is some extra frames to do the transition. So you just put it between two clips or at the beginning or end of a clip 
to edit it, you click, let me zoom in because this is really small. So I've got my selection arrow. This is the clip selected. That's the other clip selected. Right there, I've got the transition selected and I'm gonna make this a little bit taller so that you can see it now. There's my transition selected. And you can say start at the cut, center at the cut, and now you see it's in the middle of the two of them, which is the way I want it. So it's going to be an even cut on both sides. Duration is how long you want that to be. I want it to be one second. Remember, remember with time code, it's one period zero zero because it's one second, no frames. And if I want to see the actual sh sources, I click this button and it's going to show me I'm going from the creek to Baltimore. And that was the show actual sources. And if I scrub that, that'll show me what the transition is going to look like. This is the end of this clip, and that's the beginning of the next one. And that is how you add a transition in Premiere. And if you want to remove it, there's right there. Now I've got it selected. And then you hit Backspace or Delete to get rid of it. So I'm going to show you the basic transitions that most editors use. You got to cross dissolve which I'm going to center the cut. And that's just fading from one clip to the next. We've all seen that. I'm going to delete that. I'm going to do a dip to black. And what that does is you fade out of black and in. Fade in or out of black, I should say. And when you do dissolves, I'm when you do a fade out to black. Doing that type of edit it's going to make it seem like more time passed, especially if you've got a long cut. Because um, the fade out to black and then fading in from black or white will make it seem like a lot of time has passed. So be careful with that. You don't want to misuse that. And the last big cut people use, well, we've all seen irises, like a, let's do a round one. That's just a circle come in or out of the next clip. Let me type and look for it. Oh, here it's linear wipe. I had to type in to find it, but oh, there must be something wrong with the update on that one. But you've all seen a linear wipe. That's Star Wars, you know, just a wipe going across the screen. You could delve into that one on your own time. Like I said, I'm not going to hold you up with it. I showed you how to set your render bars in After Effects. And you can see my video ends here and the audio runs well past it. To set your in and out points, let's pretend I want to start the render here. I move the playhead to where I want it to start, right click, and choose Mark In. Then move my playhead to where I want to stop, and I choose Mark Out. And this gray area right here is all that's going to render. You could always drag to change it. And that's how you set your render area. Okay, now we're going to talk about rendering, and then I'm going to talk about compression. I got to make sure my audio is unmuted, because remember, if it's muted, this is where it's really important when you're dealing with video. Make sure your audio is not muted. See these blue boxes? That's telling you what panel you have selected. I've got my source panel, program monitor selected. Now I'm in my timeline. Make sure your timeline is selected, and you have the proper sequence selected that you want to render then go file export media and then media encoder pops up much faster in here than in after effects uh, premiere is phenomenal for editing video it works off of the speed for watching the video in real time whereas adobe after effects is more for animation and it has to render everything so H.264 is basically what most people do. It plays on a Mac and a PC. The bitrate you can set right here. And I'm going to show you another spot to set that. Right here is where you name it. And then you set where it's going to go. Save. Export audio, export video. Those are clicked. So I know I'm going to get both audio and video exported. Source. This is what my source, the project file is at. 
and there's the output what it's going to end up being rendered at and they match they're the same size and they're the same frame rate that's very important if it's got to match you know make sure it matches the only settings you really mess around with are video if i want to resize this say it's going to be for um some social media and it has to be let's say 1200 by whatever i click the check mark i'm going to keep this linked so that i keep the aspect ratio so if i change this to 1200 the aspect ratio changes with it now say this had to be a square and i know it was 1080 by 1080 well what i'm going to do then is i unclick the aspect ratio and this is when you've got to make sure you know exactly what you're doing for the final size and now i've got a square video 1080 by 1080 so i'm going to put back on aspect ratio put that back up to 1920 by 1080 i'm just showing you how to change the That's how you change the size. You gotta check this box first. Or I should say uncheck it. Frame rate, if you need to change the frame rate, click that box and then you can change it. Now, careful changing the frame rate because remember I told you before, video is synchronous media. The audio and the video are synced up. Changing the frame rate, if you've got a long enough video, the audio and video will go out of sync because you've changed that frame rate square pixels that's just you know what most digital cameras shoot at that's fine computers and displays and all that these days they're square they used to be rectangular so you don't need to worry about that bit rate here is the main thing so right here we can see at a bit rate of 10 my estimated file size is 71 megs the higher the bitrate, the better the quality, but now you see it almost quadrupled. So the higher the bitrate, the better the quality of the video, but the larger the file size. I have a lot of clients where I do uh, short web videos for them, and it has to be below a certain size. Most of them, it's got to be below 20 megs for a website. So I would go between two or three, and I'd see that that would be fine. But remember, the higher the bitrate, the better the quality, but the larger the file size. And then you just hit the export button when you're all done. And it renders. Now, if you've got a very large, detailed file, I'm going to show you that in a second once this is done rendering. And I'm going to hit cancel because I don't want you to have to sit through this. And I'm going to hit cancel there. We're going to pretend that rendered. Now, pretend I've got dozens of layers and sound effects and motion design and I just want to do a render um, test for compression saying like get a quick pass off to the client and I only have time to render it once what you want to do you want to go to a very detailed part of the image where there's a lot of tone and texture and things like that so we'll use this part of the area so I'll hit mark in and then go to here and hit mark out. So we're only doing a few frames so that when I go to my render to do a compression test, since I'm only doing a few frames, I can mess around with the compression and see if it's really worth um, going to a really high compression. I could say, oh, let's see what it looks like at 40 and then hit export. And then I could do a comparison at 20 and then hit export and look at them side by side and say, well, this is going to render twice as fast. Well, I mean, it's going to be a half the size and render faster with the more compressed. So that's how you can mess around with your compression. Just go to a really detailed spot, get a few seconds of it and render it. And, you know, that's when it really matters rather than render out your entire project. Like, say you've got an hour long video. You don't want to you don't want to render that hour long video and then have to change your compression settings. So. That's a good way of juggling around some things and, you know, getting a fast render and figuring out the right compression. Remember, the higher the bitrate, the larger the file size, the more detail, 
the lower the bitrate, you're going to start getting some pixelation. Uh, the gradients and detail will be lost, but you'll have a smaller file. And that's important for when you're doing things for people's websites and social media and whatnot. You want to get the best quality with the smallest file so it uploads and streams faster. It's all about juggling those. The length of the video and the compression settings you use. I'm going to clear in and out there and that gets rid of the tiny little render area that I selected. I'm going to put this clip. I'm going to trim the beginning and the end of it like such. Right click, ripple delete so it snaps to the beginning. Good. I've got another clip. I'm just going to trim a little bit of the beginning, trim a little bit of the end, snap it together. And the third clip, same thing. I'm going to trim some off the beginning and the end. Now, normally you'd be more precise trying to find a good endpoint and a good out point, but um, all I needed to do was edit these, the beginning and the end, to show you how these next two tools work. All right, so the first tool we're going to do is the slip tool right over here. The way the slip tool works, I'm going to be at the middle clip. I'm going to zoom out. And you see the arrow change right here. So I'm in the middle of this clip and I'm clicking and dragging and let me hit undo. I'll make this bigger so that everyone can see. So I've got my slip tool. I'm hovered over the clip. There we go. And what this is doing is on the bottom right, that is the out frame and the bottom left is the in frame. So if I want this to go out where the tractor is in the middle, that's what's going to happen. So you'll see this. I get to the end. There's the tractor in the middle. What the slip tool does, think of this saying, um, let me make sure the clip is deselected. There we go. Now if I put the slip tool over it, now it works. The way the slip tool works, I use the expression slip under the covers and slide over the roof of a car. So the slip tool, the clips surrounding it, the out point of this does not change and the in point of this one does not change. I'm just changing what you see in between these two clips as if it was sliding below them. Still have the same clip length. I'm just changing the in and out points of the clip inside it, uh, if that makes sense. So say this is, uh, let's make this clip two seconds long. So I hit the up key to get the beginning of it. I go down and do six seconds. So I've got a very short clip now with the slip tool right here I can click and drag and you'll see that it's changing on the left that's the in point and on the right is the out point so it's such a short clip that we make it a little longer so now I want to use my slip tool good it's going to start with the truck just on the frame and be almost off the frame when it ends and you say well why would I ever need a tool like this and the reason for that is when you're doing commercial work in each clip every frame matters because the commercial is gonna be like 30 seconds long so you want the best amount of frames in there like say you're pouring a coffee you want the right part of your shot to make it look its best that's why the slip tool is so useful the slide tool when I click and drag you see the clip moving over the other two edges I'm gonna zoom in so you can see that One second the slide tool is the opposite of the slip tool so as I drag this you see the edges to the left and the right of that clip move the length of this clip in the middle stays the same I'm changing where the clips surrounding it begin and end so let me move up here so we can see the whole thing. So slide, slide over on the bottom left. That's the out point 
of the clip in front of it and the bottom right is the the bottom right is the end point of the clip next to it so you notice the duration of my video does not change like the whole length of the clip i'm just changing how long these three clips are while keeping the duration the same length so this is in effect taking this middle clip and moving where it goes over the clips between it without changing the length of this clip in the middle i'm changing the length of the clips around it that's what the slide tool does and the slip tool keeps the length of all three clips it's just changing what part you see of the clip that you've got selected so like what's inside that amount of time these are useful like i said if you're doing commercial work and it's got to be 30 seconds exact the slip and the slide tool are your best friends i'm going to drag a song in here up here we've got the clip audio mixer and what i could do here is make an entire track change the volume of everything on that track so even though i've got three different audio tracks on track two over here and they're all different volumes if i move this that'll change the volume of that track let me undo that what i do when i'm editing down my videos if i've got everything here you know uh, as good as i want it i right click and i choose nest and then you can name whatever you want a nested sequence is um just like a pre-comp in after effects so now I, I just move that to track one let me zoom in so we can see what we're doing here so now when i change the audio on track one every clip goes up uniformly And I can change the volume on track two. So now you hear the sound effects from that shot plus the music. You can hear them both. Getting things to sound the right uh, way is called mixing. And you shouldn't really mix with headphones on. The dialogue should be the loudest then sound effects, and then finally background music. It's called background music for a reason. Uh, you want there to fill up and make your piece sound more professional, but you uh, don't want it to be overpowering it. So that's just a quick look at doing some sound mixing in Adobe Premiere. And if I wanted this clip to be louder than the other two, I would just go inside that nest, go to my effects control, turn off the level if I don't want the I'm turning off the level if I don't want to keyframe the audio if I want to just blank it make it louder I just scrub along there and now this part is way louder than the ones around it and inside this nest over here in my mixer I can still adjust the uniform volume I can still adjust the uh, volume of this mix uniformly so I went inside the nest to select the individual part and make it louder and then back to here to work on the rest of the piece uniformly. That's just a quick overview of audio mixing. The 15th is Friday. All grades have to be in Friday. Now, so if I gave everyone until the end of lab for that Wednesday the 13th, would you all work through lab and then you come back on like Thursday and we have a virtual critique Thursday and then I can get the grades in on time. So do you want to do the critique Wednesday at the end of class or Thursday so you've got that full night to render? Now I just noticed this, I'm going to point out to you. This forearm in the back, my layer stack is wrong. You see it passing between the hip and the thighs. That would not happen. And this is a great reason why you should name your layers so you can find things more easily. So I know it's 
forearm back that I'm going to take both of them and put them below the legs. Now it's passing through properly. I'm glad you varied up the trees. Watch combining the photorealistic clouds with the hand-drawn clouds as well. You want your artwork to be uniform. Love what you did with the sand. Definitely has more depth and texture to it now. But you see right there, you can see the real ones as opposed to the hand-drawn ones. You could just grab one of the hand-drawn ones and change the shape and scaling of it a bit so uh, it's got a consistent feel to it but um, matches the look and feel of the other ones. I think you should keep the hand drawn because everything else in your artwork is hand drawn. So the hand drawn fits with this, the theme but once you start putting in photos with hand drawn stuff that's when the compositing gets off a little bit like you know the overall look of the scene. Okay, I can see the bird wings flapping much better. I'm trying to find that rabbit layer. What's going to really help this is shadows uh, throughout the piece. Um, having shadows where things contact the ground is really going to help anchor this a lot. That's, that's a great, I love what you do with the sand. Great job on that, by the way. Yeah, and like I said, get rid of the real clouds and just come up with another cloud that looks like this in a different shape. Okay, so that's this boulder right over here. So first, I'm going to try a drop shadow on it. I just right clicked and go choose layer style drop shadow. Okay, I'm not liking the way that looks, so I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, that's not working either, so I'm gonna get rid of that. Okay, so yeah, like I said, keep the hand-drawn clouds, get rid of the photo ones now. I'm gonna try this, one second. Okay, so what I did was I just duplicated the layer and I horizontally flipped it. I mean, I vertically flipped it by right clicking on it and I went transform flip vertical and I lined it up where I wanted it and um, I changed the opacity and the mode. Now remember, here's your switches, click switches and modes. Here's your modes. I tried a color burn on it and if you wanted to, you could uh, change the scaling on this a little bit. But see, that's going to get a little weird. Uh, you could try if your anchor point oh, is at the bottom. And then you non-uniformly scale. Move that because it's showing a little bit behind the rock. And if you wanted, you could probably even um, shear it or slant it with nope not that it'll probably be z yep now you've got a much better shadow and if you wanted you could probably take those uh, changes you did and just copy and paste them on each shadow in the scene that you create and you notice it tracks with the object and moves with it because you duplicated it. So it adds some extra pop to the scene. Yeah, so that's the best way to do it. Like I said, duplicate the item, flip it vertically, line it up, scale it a little bit, um, change the opacity and the blending mode, and then it's gonna sit in your scene pretty nicely. It's like this one over here on the side. I'm gonna duplicate that. Do the same thing. Flip it vertically, move it. Once I have the layer selected, I could just grab that fill effect just to save some time. And 
and if those layers were closer together I could copy and paste uh, the stuff so if I hit R for rotate T for transparency here's my rotate on C on 18 I pasted the uh, rotation into the there we go into the opacity by accident and don't forget you gotta move the anchors and then the opacity was 36 in a blend mode of color burn then just watch that they all line up properly You see, if this, if all these were set with cast shadows on, we might be able to put a light in the sky to cast these shadows automatically. But you know, it's six of one, half a dozen of another. It's you know, you gotta figure out what you want to do. I'll turn on one for this tree right here, and we'll see how that looks. Okay, so that's this tree over here. So I turned cast shadows on. Add shadows, replace it. Yes. Uh, no, no, the birds are fine. Um, just watch that rabbit, the motion on the rabbit. Um, okay, so I've set that to cast shadows. Let me add a light into the scene. And that's set to cast shadows. Oh uh, yeah, see that's what's gonna happen. Is it's gonna shadow up the whole scene, so it looks like the workflow for you would be to duplicate the layers, then just make sure that they're lining up right. And I gotta make sure that I have this marker on top of that so that shadow isn't climbing up on it like that. It's definitely come a long way from last week. Okay, so there are compositing plugins, but they're going to cost some money. Oh, I love seeing that title safe up. Very good way to work. I'd like to see a little life in here, even if it's just like puppet pinning a mouse, something subtle, um, and also, you know, like adding in some type here and there. Um, like what you did there, the editing choice. This smear. I'm unsure of that smear effect, but I like the creativity behind what you did there. Uh, I like the smoke you added in here. Now these clouds are moving way fast and then they ease to a slow, which is good. So I don't know, maybe let's check the motion of them real fast. I think if they moved a little slower, um, that might help that part. And I still think this guy's really fast. I'd like to see a little bit of motion with that hand, if at all possible. Are those two layers yeah, quest? Uh, so yeah, it almost looks like I like the offsetting at the end. How they don't come in together like this comes in a little bit behind it. I like that. And if you give these a treatment. I'm just mocking this up real quick. Um, so if you did 
add some texture to the, let me make this a little brighter. Just make sure you parent the texture to the uh, layer you're using as an alpha mat since it's moving through space. That way the texture moves with it and stays in place. See the difference between those two words now? How putting a little bit of texturing helps it sit in that grungy scene a little better and add some interest to it. Want me to send you this as a reference file of Curiosity Gabby? It seems like if you put some ghostly image here, like just like a little ghost drifting across uh, between the fog and here, it'll add some depth. Like I said, also adding some type, but uh, let's just see what that would look like. I love this treatment, that um, slow shutter with the motion. That looks really wild. Okay, so I've got this. Let's zoom in a little bit. Let's try and roto this out just for the fun of it. Just because I'm feeling lazy tonight. <laughs> I did the wrong. Okay, so I want to pull down auto option, delete there, down there, delete that. Let's see if that does it. And remember, if you hold down the control key, you can, uh, click and drag to make the brush smaller if you need to. Okay, much better. And it doesn't have to be perfect. We're just trying to find this person. Where's the part where it's, okay, good, it's right over here. I'm gonna freeze frame that. So I just did the option, and then the bracket next to the letter P to trim at the playhead. What I'm gonna do is prison. I could just guess where my playhead is. There it is. Okay, good. That's a fast way of going through it. If I parent this ghost to that Put it between the smoke. Now it's gonna sit in the scene and move with it. And in addition to that, I could do the position of it. Like that, and then I just noticed, like a fool, I have her on the ground. So remember the little trick, if I've got both my keyframes selected, and the playhead is over it, I can have this hover, and she's gonna move from side to side, just like such. And if you wanted, I'm gonna make sure no layers are selected. Grab a little round thing, get a fill of black, blast the edges with the blur, That'll soften it. Put that below her. Trim it to the length of her layer by using the option and the P key. I'm holding down shift to snap to the edges. And I've got to parent that to the ghost. Now the drop shadow is moving with the ghost. Okay. 
Now you can tell she's floating. And let's do one last thing. Let's play around with a blur on her. Oh, no wait, I think it's compound blur. See, it was compound blur. And let's animate that blur a little bit. See the difference? Just uh, adding one more element into each scene, a little bit of interest, a little bit of uh, playfulness, and then watching how it sits in the scene, like having this between the smoke and the building. So that's a little something for reference. You just find little ways like that you could be playful with these first few images. Like I said, the mouse in there, or something like that, and puppet pin it. He could even just be sitting in the corner eating something like cheese or a bone, you know. That's come along very nicely. I like the playfulness of it. And you're trying many different techniques, which is what I like to see.